we change our perspective, we can see that trees are nature's great connectors. When trees breathe, so do we. Each breath, cleaning the air and restoring balance. Our past, present and future are intertwined with trees, yet we have lost the ability to see them. To thrive, we must fall in love again with our city's trees and nurture our urban forests. Hello, 1517. We don't have a lot in common, you being a tree and all. I'm glad we're in this together. Regards, a tree lover. Hello, tree. It's your mother. How come you never call? Hello everyone and welcome back to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I am your host and today with me I have three wonderful, incredible people who are behind the amazing Project Titan, which is probably one of the most exciting projects I've ever gotten to witness. Maybe ever, actually, if I'm going to be dramatic about it, but that's how I feel, so here we are. <laughs> Um, first off, let's go through, introduce our guest for today. Aaron, let's start with you. Why don't you tell the people a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. I'm Aaron. Uh, I'm based in the UK. I am a senior technical artist uh, and I run the tech content team uh, here at Epic. No big deal. <laughs> just to get, you know, I just run this team. It's fine. <laughs> it's, a, it's a team of three. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, on to our next guest. <laughs> Sam, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself as well? Hi, I'm Sam. I'm a technical designer on the technical content team, which is run by Aaron, if you didn't pick that up. Um, he runs it, and uh, I guess I do things for him. <laughs> if you've good. read any of the Perforce docs for Project Titan, that was me. I wrote those, come yell at me, not anyone else. <laughs> I was going to say, everybody come say thank you to Sam, but please don't yell uh, at Sam. <laughs> yell at me gently. gently. <laughs> Is that yelling still? The soft yell. Know. The soft yeah, yell, anyway. that's fine. <laughs> Whisper yell. Mm -hmm. And last, but certainly not least, we have Sebastian. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself as well? Hey, Tina. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Sebastian Hernandez. I think it's the first time I'm, I'm doing a live stream, so I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I'm the last third of the um, tech content team. Uh, I'm like uh, Sam and Aaron in, in this, except I also do C++ eventually uh, at, at the intervals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, the three of you are here today to talk a little bit about Project Titan, some of the things around it, and of course, answer the myriad of questions that I'm sure a lot of you will have about the project as this goes through. The format of today's stream is going to be a little bit different. I know typically we save kind of a longer Q&A segment for the end, but we're going to tackle this one as 
just kind of a general Q&A overall. So if you have questions at any point, please feel free to toss them into the chat there. We'll collect them and we'll just kind of rapid fire go through them as we go through the content. So make sure if you have a question, don't be shy. Toss it in there. We're happy to help. Um, but yeah, Aaron. Where? There we go. Nope, wrong way. There we go, Aaron. <laughs> Um, for anyone who's unfamiliar with Project Titan, do you want to give them a little bit of an overview of what this is and what we're getting into? Yeah. And I want to swear. I'm not going to, but <laughs> I, I really want to because it's been Wait, absolutely... 10 minutes. <laughs> it's been, yeah, it's been absolutely astounding, right? So so basically what we've done is 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 something that's a little bit insane. Um, and, and it took some convincing uh, from other people internally at Epic to even let us do this. Uh, so we'll see how well it goes to see if we ever do it again. Um, but basically, we're, we've we've set up um, kind of a, a game studio um, in, you know, kind of, but completely externally, right? So we've got a project called Project Titan. Uh, it is a massive open world game. So it's about eight kilometers by eight kilometers of fully explorable game world. Um, we've got a playable character that has loads of different movement modes and um, you can, you know, you can sail, you can grapple, hook onto different items, you can sprint. Um, we're going to be fleshing out this project as we go. And rather than doing what we normally do internally at Epic, which is where we noodle away on a project and very secretively for you know, kind of like six months or four months or whatever. And then we come out at the end of it and we're like, hey, look at this really cool thing that we've made. You know, good luck figuring out how we made it. Um, you know, we're we're gonna we're gonna open the entire thing up. So we're gonna show you, you know, like really how the sausage is made on all of this stuff. Um, so rather than give you this fully finished, you know, kind of beautiful sample game, we're giving you this completely unfinished, um, ugly sample game. Uh, and we're all going to kind of collaborate together to build this this project. Um, that means it's going to be absolute chaos and madness uh, for two months, which we completely uh, expect and have planned for. Um, so what? going for like that Joker level of, you know, you tell people that it's going to be an anarchy and no one panics, um, you know, kind of level of stuff. So, yeah. Um, so if we if we do a screen share quickly, we'll run through um, you know, kind of some of the, the the big bones of the project, and then we'll dive into the actual sample itself so that you can see this stuff uh, and how we've gone about setting it up. Um, so it's a it's a global art jam, right? Which means that that basically we've we've just onboarded, um, just you know, kind of, I think we hit three thousand signups a couple of days before. Um, so we have just gone from the three of us in the Perforce server to 3,000 people um, who now have full access, full in quotes, there's some stuff they don't have access to, but pretty much full access to uh, to the entirety of the project. Um, so it's going to be a little bit chaotic uh, when we do that, right? Because we've we've never done this before. This is the first time we're doing it. We're, we've created a fully professional developer environment for this stuff, right? Which means that, that there are very few barriers um, on, on what you can do and what you can submit. Um, we will be obviously moderating content as it comes in, um, but we're very much trusting everyone in the project to be professional um, and, and, you know, kind of do the stuff because it's the only way to really run it effectively, right? Um, so basically, you're all joining the project. Hopefully you picked your category on ArtStation. Uh, if you haven't, you can still sign up um, for it now, um, though you won't get to join straight away. We do have a bit of a delay from when you join to when you go through. So um, if, you've, if you've applied in the last day uh, or so, you might have been missed from the initial bucket. We're going to be doing um, kind of like an update to who we let onto the Perforce server every week or so. Um, so you might just have to wait until the next batch comes through. But basically, you can do character, you can do environment, you can do uh, materials, props, and, and effects. Um, so we have those groups of people. Um, and you can either work on your own, just kind of going in and creating, you know, kind of bits and pieces, or you can form a team or a group um, based out of either a biome um, or like a, a goal, a, you know, a particular shared goal that you might have for the project. 
Um, so there's a lot of room in Titan, so we, we should be okay. But we do expect you to, uh, you know, kind of not clash, um, but, but meld um, as you kind of go through. This is very much a collaborative exercise, which means that even if you're working as a solo um, artist, you still have to talk to and collaborate with all of the people who are working because at the end of the day, we're all building one single project, right? It's not, um, we haven't divided the map into 3000 sections and given everyone their own little plot of land to do what they want. It is a single cohesive world that we're building here. So that means that everyone has to collaborate. And in order for them to do that, they have to communicate. Um, to that end, we set up a Discord channel, which is already over 500 people and has been up for three hours, I think, um, so far. The, the collaboration that we're already seeing on there is absolutely staggering. It's incredible uh, to look through. It's so wholesome uh, as well at the moment. We're hoping that that stays. So please keep it, you know, keep it friendly and and lovely. There's already people like reaching out to offer help and advice for people. We've got some amazing people already on there who are already jumping on and supporting other developers with getting uh, Perforce set up and things like that. So it's that's brilliant to see. And the more of that we have, um, you know, the, the better. Um, we have seen as well that there's a few people asking, are there any producers on this project? Who I'm guessing are like from like, <laughs> like, like a big tech team. The answer to that is uh, is is no, not really. Um, we have a producer who's going to help us. Who's called Judah. He's not on the stream today. He's recovering from uh, from GDC, uh, wow. as many people internally at Epic are. Um, but we are uh, we are um, kind of uh, going to be focusing on making sure that we self organize. So that we've created several Discord channels and groups. Um, I recommend that if you're in environment, then you group into a particular biome. That doesn't mean you can't switch back and forth between different ones, um, but we should go there. Um, we are looking for people to step up as moderators, as um, as people who want to be owners of, um, of certain biome areas so that they can help manage that stuff. Um, we will be finding you. Uh, as as you post and as you add content, uh, and we'll be reaching out, so we'll be we'll be letting you know. Um, but yes, uh, the the plan is is that you can go anywhere, you can build, you can create, and you can add. Um, but keep in mind that everything that you're building and adding does need to be part of one uh, cohesive world. So this is our our tech content team. There are there are four of us. Uh, you know, kind of technically as a as a whole that we're working through. So uh, Sam, myself, Sebastian, uh, and Judah, we each kind of tackle a different area. So I'm uh, a tech art background. Sam's very much on the design, uh, uh, and Seb is more on the programming side. So he's kind of done all of the kind of the the back end programming for that. Uh, Sam did mo most of the design of the of the actual um, world that you're that you're seeing if you've downloaded the project yet and you're going through. Uh, and Jude is going to be helping out to kind of try, try and help get that management going through of the project. But um, yeah, we're not going to be a producer led studio. Uh, it's going a bit, I think Naughty Dog talked about how they don't have any producers uh, in the uh, last of a suit. I don't know how that works, but we're about to find out how that works for our project and we'll see how well it goes. Um, on top of that, we have some wandering critics. Uh, who are going to be in the in the game world, which I I love. I'm hoping we can get a few more actually uh, coming through. Um, but these are seriously incredible artists who are from uh, from a few different backgrounds. Um, you know, so they have got a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of experience. You can go and they're all on ArtStation, so you can have a look at their portfolios. They are going to be traversing the world of Titan. Uh, and and finding your content and giving you feedback on that. Uh, you can also post it in the Discord as well and, and they'll be finding it. We'll also be giving feedback as well. And we encourage everyone uh, to, to kind of feedback on other people's work and offer them, uh, you know, kind of critique uh, and advice. The main thing we just want to make clear is that, you know, it's critique, not criticism. Um, so make sure, you know, kind of when you're critiquing that that is, um, is, is never relates back to the artist, right? It should never be about the artist. It should always be focused on the work um, and, and try to keep it as, you know, as professional 
and, and clear as possible um, as you you know as you're giving out feedback. Um, it won't result in an immediate ban if you do um, <laughs> get a bit too heavy with there, but we will be reaching out and saying, hey, you know, kind of like uh, dial it back a little a little bit um, as we go through. Um, one last thing as well. So uh, this project is only possible um, because of our partners at Perforce and AWS. Um, so AWS are, uh, have basically given us all of the funding that we need to run all of the server and backend stuff that we're doing. So um, in order to get 3,000 people uh, onto a shared server and have that all working, it requires a tremendous amount of backend. Um, we are going to be doing a live stream where we cover all of the backend setup um, for a studio up to, um, you know, kind of like this size but and, and beyond. Uh, but we'll also be looking at smaller setups as well. So um, if you're interested in getting your own Perforce server set up or um, any of that stuff, we'll be doing a live stream later on. We've also got a Horde set up as well, which is the automated build, um, which will be running in Titan. So that's going to be doing automated HLog builds of all of the background uh, world generation. Um, we'll be going uh, through all of that as well. And also, uh, we've got Cloud DDC, which isn't online just yet, um, mainly because we don't need it straight away, because uh, there's nothing to DDC just yet, uh, or DCC yet. Um, and uh, But it will be soon. And again, we're going to be going over all of that stuff um, as, we, uh, as we go through. Um, Perforce are the same as well. Um, so uh, they provided uh, a license for um, three <laughs> 3,000 people uh, to join, um, which is not a, is not a cheap, uh, you know, kind of cheap thing by any means once you get to that kind of uh, level of scale. Um, so we really are kind of reaching um, a proper AAA studio uh, at that point. So thank you so much for them. We'll be diving into more details about how all that stuff is set up in the background to kind of help you get uh, that stuff set up. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it's really great to, to get that going. Um, I feel like I've been talking for a while, so but I'll keep going until someone stops me. Um, <laughs> <Go on. laughs> I do have some questions for you, but uh, yeah. I wasn't sure if you wanted to finish some of your slides and then go through. Let's hit a question. Um, and let's do and, it. Yeah. Um. So the first one that I think, yeah, before we go too far into the style and all of that, there are some people who are curious about if this is art oriented only, or if this also applies to programming and programmers. That's a really good question. Um, so yeah, this project is purely uh, art focused. Um, so it's about the creation of characters, environments, and VFX. Um, we are stretching a little bit. We've welcomed some animators on uh, who've who've already joined, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but at this stage, we're kind of um, because this is the first time that we've run this. Uh, we're not sure how difficult it's going to be to manage artists, let alone uh, programmers who may be, you know, kind of like breaking breaking the project every now and then with um, with their code submits. Um, I'm sure many of you would do absolutely fine. Um, so for the, for this particular project, it's purely art focused, unfortunately. Um, but that being said, some of the live streams that we're going to be running. Um, we will be doing some, uh, in, you know, kind of demonstration of the back end. So the actual game itself is built with the new mover component, which is going to replace the standard character component. Uh, we'll be doing a live stream where we go over how all of that stuff is set up. Uh, and like I said, we'll also be going into a lot of the back end uh, of how uh, this kind of setup is uh, is created um, for that, which is going to be very um you know kind of devops um focus for that kind of thing so if you're interested in how an epic studio um is set up or or should be set up we've got some really good content coming for you and that hopefully will make up for the fact that um we're not doing any uh programming ad uh for this uh for this one next time next yeah, time yeah <laughs> maybe we'll see <laughs> um and then one more question for you and i will let you continue um so there was a question about the categories because you have to sign up for a category when you register. Um, they're wondering if it's okay to join a few different categories or also what if someone wants to leave or join a different category later? Um, you can, 
um, but it's unnecessary. Uh, so the categories are very much for kind of like people to kind of self-assign to. Um, but once you're in the server, you can submit anything. We don't have any restrictions in place um, for for that. So if you've joined for the character, um, you know, kind of category, you still have full access to the environment and props uh, section. So you can submit content there just as easily as if you were submitting a character. So it's kind of like the um, the Simpsons episode where there's all the different types of duff and it's all feeding into like the what, like just <laughs> the, the one thing feeding into like different nozzles. Um, mm -hmm. So you've all been fed into the, the same project. You all have access to it. Uh, again, you know, we're, we're, we're trusting you with, um, with with this project, um, so you have full access to uh, to that side of things um, as you go. So you can do anything. You can flip flop back and forth between different roles. You can start off, um, and again, we we'd actually encourage if you've not done this kind of thing before, either through Perforce or through um, you know kind of like high end game development or triple A game development, um, you might want to actually start off just doing a prop just to get yourself into the kind of like the the flow of building an asset and putting it in the project and uploading it and syncing it and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, you can go back and forth between any of the any of the groups. You don't need awesome. to join a new challenge. Perfect. I lied, I have one super quick question and then I'll let you continue. That's fine. <laughs> That's all we're here um, for. <laughs> yeah. There's a few questions about the Discord invite and where they can find it. The Discord invite is in the email that you will have, will have received um, when you join the challenge. Um, so if you haven't received that email yet and you joined, um, you need to let us know. If you if you signed up before, I think it's the 25th, uh, when we did the initial sample of data um, going in. Um, if it was after that, you may have just missed the point where we added all the users. Um, you'll just have to wait a little bit. Um, until we go around and add the the newest batch of uh, developers, we're not going to be doing that every day because it's it's a bit of a time sink. Um, so you will have to wait until we go through. But yeah, the Discord link is available uh, through that email, um, and we're keeping it so it's just the developers who are participating will have access to that. All right, fantastic. All righty. Okay. Continue. <laughs> you All have right. the floor. So we've. Um, we're trying to keep this as open as possible. We we don't want to limit, um, you know, kind of the the kind of things that that people can do. Um, but that being said, as a as an artist, having some limitations in place can allow you to be a bit more creative and a, and, and give you a bit more. So we have created a rough brief for the world, um, which is this. Um, so it's set in a pre-industrial era. Um, we have magic in the world, and it's used, um, you know, kind of in, in a commonplace um, way. We have uh, long dead titans, uh, which is why the project is called Project Titan, or one of the reasons, uh, scatter the world. Um, so they're barely visible. They've been basically dead and gone for so long that they've been completely overgrown and replaced. So um, when we're building them, they should be hard to see, right? They should be so embedded into the landscape that they've kind of just become part of it. Um, the world's packed with a variety of biomes. We have a ton. We've got an Arctic area, a volcanic region, a sulfur region, a wetlands, a um, an island like a dedicated island where we're kind of starting the player off. Uh, we've got a desert region and so on. So there's lots of different areas where you can go through, and each of those biomes should be um, regionally distinct, right? They should have their own. Um, you know, kind of characters, their own kind of building, uh, you know, kind of styles. If we, if you create buildings in that region, and they should be really kind of um, visually distinct, just so we can kind of give people as much variety as possible uh, as they're building. The art style itself should be stylized, um, so we're not going for realism. Um, so that means that you, you know, you won't be submitting any like. Uh, mega scan data or anything like that. It will be, um, you know, should be hand authored content that that looks hand authored. Um, so we're looking for exaggerated forms. We're looking for fantastical designs uh, and the textures and sculptural details should be very painterly uh, in nature. We've provided uh, a range of tutorials. Um, which seemed like a good way of kind of like sharing the kind of art style we created. It's um, the one that we've gone for is is very, you know, kind of seen very commonly uh, in game development. Um, so you can have a look at these. They're on the ArtStation brief. I believe they're also in the technical art guide as well. Um, 
as we go through. Uh, so you can have a look at the different um, ones that we have available uh, all on there. And uh, that's kind of like the, the main brief that we're going to, right? So the goal as you're creating should be working towards that kind of general standard. Um, but then as more content gets added, it will be a case of trying to conform and kind of like build a cohesive art style for the world. So um, again, while we're building one world, um, they're not going to be disparate regions that are completely different in art style and trend. It should all be considered one cohesive um, universe that we're that we're trying to create here with this uh, with the project. Um, before you submit anything, um, I want to make it really really clear uh, as we go through um, that the final project once it's done will be submitted as a uh, will be released as a sample game. Now, if you aren't used to Epic's ecosystem, the sample games that we make are the actual Unreal project itself. So these are not packaged final versions that people can play. They are the actual game project itself. And that means that all of the assets, all of the things that we're creating are going to be made publicly available as part of that sample. So if you are not happy uh, with your assets being released publicly once that content um, is you know kind of is finished um, please don't submit any any of that work right we don't we don't want you being unhappy about that um, so you can still participate tangentially you can still build stuff for it but don't if you but don't submit it to the titan server um, it's part of the the agreement that you that you agree to uh, when when you join the project that this stuff would be released. Um, so I just want to be really really upfront and and public about that before uh, before we do it. Um, we need people to be able to see that stuff and, and go through. So um, we've got all of that stuff, but we want it to be a testament. We didn't want this project to die um, once it finished. We wanted it to to actually live on. So having it as a fixed sample, um, you know, is going to is going to help with all of that, um, you know, kind of content. Um, so yeah, we've got that. Uh, we want it. It is going to be primarily used as a learning resource. But um, you should keep in mind that once people have that content, they can release it uh, themselves as a packaged project. So while they can't release the content as a um, a new uh, a, you know a new sample project on the marketplace and sell it, they can use it in their own games um, for public release. So so just keep in mind that when you're you know you're building that content, people can use it for that. We've had that with our sample games, right? When we built them, uh, Crop Out is a great example of that. When we released it, um, I think it was like forty eight hours, uh, and someone had already published it on Steam and on Android. Um, so, we're, but we again, that's you know that that's kind of how it is. Um, so we're you know we're hoping this content gets released and is a great learning resource for for everyone uh, on that. Uh, so just some things to keep in mind before we jump into, um, you know, kind of an overview of the actual project and dive in engine. Uh, launch day and, and probably the first couple of days before that is going to be pretty manic. Um, like I said, we're going from three people to 3000 people. Uh, we are we have tried to battle test it uh in in <laughs> in as best way possible but ultimately um you know we've created a live dev environment and we've let a ton of people into it so um at the the very start of the project is when we are going to get the most amount of um of people trying to mess with it right um because they because they don't care for whatever reason um Please be patient with us. Um, the great thing about Perforce and version control is that we see what every single person has done, right? Every time you submit content, it's tagged with that user. Um, and we're going to be very aggressive um, with um, how we keep that project clean and, um, and maintain. So if you do submit anything or you do anything to, to make the project not work or damage it, submit inappropriate or offensive content, anything um, that is uh, you know, vulgar uh, in any way, um, or try to disrupt the artists who are generally try like genuinely trying to contribute to the project, we'll remove you um, and you won't be let back in. So please don't do that. Um, it's, it's, it's a very, <laughs> it's a very minor annoyance for us 
and uh, but it's a bigger annoyance to the people who are actually trying to um, to learn from this and and to do it. So, um, lightest threat ever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, conversely or inversely um, to that. The servers are set up as a real world dev environment. We've put a massive amount of trust in the people who we've put onto here. Um, but you may see uh, inappropriate offensive content get posted onto there. And some of that content may be triggering. Um, we will remove that content as quickly as we can. Um, but unfortunately, we can't check the content before it's submitted. Um, <laughs> because that's just <laughs> that's just how it works, right? So um, we will be removing the content as soon as we can. We've got a set um, channel, which is called report content uh, on the Discord. If you see anything that's inappropriate, don't delete it yourself um, because uh, then we can't see it anymore. Um, just flag it there. Uh, we'll see it, we'll pick it up. We will check it, we'll delete it, and we'll kick the user out who submitted it. Like I said, it's it's very easy for us to track who's done it. Um, so we'll be removing those people as we go through. Um, but do keep in mind that, that you may be seeing some stuff that obviously um, you wouldn't normally want to see in your day to day life um, as you go through. Um, with the kind of the, the downer stuff aside <laughs> on that, um, the keys to this being successful are uh, communicating um, with your with your fellow artists. There are a lot of you on here. You're all going to be submitting content, um, and the best way that you can you can do that is by communicating with everyone uh, that's on there. All of the assets that you submit to the project are shared, um, which means that other people can work on them, and other people should work on them. Uh, and the same goes for environments. You cannot gatekeep anything um, that you've created. You, you can't create your own little paradise uh, and not let anyone else participate. You have to allow um, people in to, to collaborate on this stuff, and you should. And it's the best way that you're going to develop um, as an artist. If you are, if you're a student coming in um, and you've, you've not been in, in the games industry before, um, this is a great opportunity for you to to kind of like get a real taste of what it's like to work and collaborate with this many people and go through. Um, so the, you need to keep in mind that we are building a world together, um, not tons of little separated um, areas. Uh, when you start off, start small <laughs> and finish what you start. Um, please don't start some massive citadel uh undertaking and then not finish it um because we will just delete it ultimately uh and someone else can post stuff there yeah, instead um if you're not going to contribute to it um when you're submitting submit often uh and update often for the perforce server um you we don't have a set asset list we don't have a set um, you know, kind of world that we're building because we want it to be open for you uh, to be able to create what you want within that universe. Um, but that does have the drawback, <laughs> right? That um, that there's there's no structure to it in that way. So if you want to build a citadel, my advice is to block it out very quickly, put it into the game world, and then start developing out, and then start pulling people in. Right, because that's the best way that you can start building it, and and you know if you need a dedicated channel for uh, an area that you're creating, you can ping us and we'll add one for you on Discord so that you can set that one up. Um, but this is going to be very much self-directed. Um, so if you haven't submitted to a Perforce server before, if this is your first time working on a uh, a large scale game environment, start with something small. Even if you're not a prop artist, start with a small prop. Um, you know, kind of build it, check it, get through everything, get it submitted. Um, and like I said, do it in stages. So don't don't sit in a little silo and noodle away on a thing for days and days because other people don't know what you're making at that point. <laughs> and if other people don't know what you're making, then they might try and start making the same thing. So if you want to build a bridge that's reusable, build that block out and then submit it, right? So your block out should take no more than 10 minutes. Build your block out, submit it, get that get that identifier made, 
and then start fleshing it out, start iterating on it. Um, if another artist wants to join in, you should be open to that. You should you should welcome them in uh, and let them join uh, on that so that they can kind of build an area. Or if the bridge is broken down into multiple sections, then you can go in and you can you can support that. Um, but just you know, kind of keep that in as your, uh, in mind as you're going. Uh, and then finally, critique. Uh, it, like I said, we've got roaming critics uh, wandering uh, wandering the landscape and the world. It's not optional. Um, like I said, we're trying to give a, a decent simulation of a dev environment for, for students who are joining um, and we want this uh, work to be iterated on, to be improved and, um, you know, to have a, a, a really great um, demonstration of, of what all uh, you artists can do when you come together and build. So um, you do need to accept critique. Um, you should be iterating on your work and improving as you go. Um, and you should do that in, you know, kind of both the Discord server to, to submit your work, but also you can post on the art station as well. So the submission thread is open and you can post content in there. I've talked for a very long time again. Do we have any more questions? We do. We have quite a few. <laughs> um, so I will give you a break <laughs> um, by asking you questions that you then have to talk more to answer. <laughs> so oh, okay. it, it counts, right? <laughs> Um, first up, there's questions about, um, file sizes and limitations and stuff like that if they exist. So are there any limitations on prop file size, amount of textures, optimization concerns, things like that? Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so it, it very much depends on the asset. Um, we're supporting Nanite, which means that you can have some, some very high uh, geometry assets in your scene um, and depending on how those assets are built those file sizes can get you know kind of quite large um, I would say that you should try not to exceed um, again it's really hard to say without specifying a particular size but if you're building a, a very large asset um, you shouldn't try to exceed 100 meg on that particular asset um, it, you know kind of for, for in terms of mesh detail uh, don't use anything over an 8K um, texture. Uh, and we've we've made a, a master material that you can use for pretty much every prop that you'll have. There will be edge cases for that, um, but those materials should be limited to, to that general material that we've provided. It's inside the base content folder. Uh, so instance off of that and use that setup and structure. We're going to go through that a little bit later. Um, so that you have a good understanding of, of like how that works and how that's made. Um, but yeah, that, that should be the general structure. And then on, uh, I would keep to no more than three uh, material slots per asset uh, that you're doing. Don't don't import an asset that's got like 50 different material ID channels. Um, and then make sure that your assets are appropriately set up for the different distribution platforms, right? So with Titan, we are aiming to be fully cross-platform compatible, which means that uh, the game should work on Switch or on mobile um, or anything like that. Uh, now we have scalability settings, which makes a lot of that stuff really easy. So if you bring in a texture that's 8K, um, we can very easily reduce that texture down um to whatever size that we need so something like 512 right um uh for different platforms so you don't need to worry about that too much um but what you do need to concentrate on are probably your lots that you're uh that you're generating so, so this answer is getting quite in depth now um but nanite assets will work on any platform that nanite is supported on but where nanite is not supported um which is on um mobile switch it's technically supported on old uh, platforms like ps4 um, but i don't think the support is particularly great um, so i'd be wary of that so you should assume that we'll be using the fallback meshes for that and the log chain that comes with it so um, there's some automated log uh, tools built into the editor um, so you should use those as a starting point. Generally, you don't need more than three lots um, per asset, but you should generate them and then you should review them uh, when you look through. So um, you just disable Nanite and um, you, you look through the asset at the different log levels and make sure that they're acceptable. If they're not, 
uh, you probably need to go in and manually build the lot um, that you want if the full back meshes aren't good enough quality. Awesome. But yeah, we're going full dev. Full dev on this stuff. Full dev. Uh, full so dev mode, everyone. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's about getting the game working at a good frame rate as well as it looking good. Um, so we're going to be doing as much training and support on this stuff as possible. Um, we'll be posting and we'll be answering and, and doing, you know, live streams like this and covering assets. So um, we'll be reviewing all of the content that's coming in and giving you feedback on it. Um, well, maybe not all. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> as much, as as much of it as much of it as we can if you uh, didn't know about collision in the unreal engine before this you will definitely know about collision in the unreal engine by the end of this project yeah, yeah. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah it's it's a learning process we'll we'll get through it <laughs> um the next question is they're wondering can we share our progress on our own work on instagram or social media or things like that or should we keep that under wraps until the project has completed? You haven't signed an NDA, so you can <laughs> so you can share whatever you like um, about your progress with the project. Um, we will be doing a weekly live stream where we'll kind of like we'll fly through the world and we'll give uh, advice and feedback on the stuff that we see in there. Um, so we will be showing it um, throughout. Um, but the actual dev environment itself is closed, right? So only the people who've joined the project can actually access the, the project for the duration of that uh, until we release it as a sample game later on. Um, but you can, you can share any of your work and your content, any of the stuff that you've learned. Um, we encourage it. Again, we want this to be a real learning experience for as many people as possible. Um, so if you get some good feedback and you want to share that, you want to post about it, then that's that's brilliant. Um, you know, it's it's all it's all, all fair on that stuff. <laughs> yes, uh, which is a good point about for the live streams. If anyone missed that, there will be weekly live streams going on with Project Titan. Um, it'll be on Fridays at 10 a.m. Eastern. So make sure you keep out a little little chunk of time there each week if you're interested in peeking in. However, they'll work the same way as these streams do, where once they've wrapped, they'll be up on our YouTube and Twitch channel afterwards. So you can watch them afterwards at your own leisure as well if you can't make it at that exact time. But something to keep in mind, we'll be adding that to the schedule. It's going to be really fun. I'm excited to see how those go. <laughs> All right, next question here is, will the project only be released at the end or will intermediate builds be released during development as well? Uh, so it'll only be released at the end. Um, so before the sample will be released, we will be uh, doing a cleanup pass um, and it, it will need to go through legal review uh, on our side internally as well. Um, so it will take a little while for the samples to become available again. Um, we will shut down the server um, at the end of the project though. So one thing I will say is if you want to keep a copy um, for you know your own personal use, um, then make sure that you've got the latest version before um, before we shut the server down because it will only be available for the duration of the project. Fantastic. Um, next is a question about folder structure. They're wondering, if we can create our own folders under our names and then make subfolders for props, materials, etc., or do we have to create subfolders within the designated folders outlined in the document? So you should stick to the um, to the outline document um, for those assets. There's a developers folder that you can put your content into, but you won't be able to submit it. So this is a good area for testing any content if you want to uh, make a demo map or a test map. We've actually created a few templates that you can use for setting stuff up. So if you want to make a material, uh, you can go in and we've created a few assets with a few instructions on how to do it and a scale reference for our character. So you can use that as a, as a, um, as a placeholder and then you can save that to your developers folder. Um, but we have locked the developer folder so you won't be able to actually submit that to the server. Um, when it comes to actually submitting the content that you want people to interact with, you should use the standard folder structure that we've provided. So inside environment, we've got a bunch of folders um, for regional uh, assets and also global assets if they're used um, universally throughout the project. Uh, same with foliage as well. 
And then we've created a texture folder, meshes folder, a materials folder, and all of the assets should go into, uh, into that structure. So you should submit all of your content in there. Again, um, because all of the content should be shared. Um, so when you're building your content, you should be thinking about how it's reusable um, for lots of different people, right? If you build a material, if you can build it as a tileable or a trim sheet um, material, which basically means that you can kind of like tile it or use it in multiple places, um, then that's a really great way of doing it, right? And then other people can pull those in. Um, and that way, people who are mainly more focused on level design or blocking out can then use those assets um, to kind of like build out um, the larger spaces that may they're maybe developing. Um, but yeah, stick to the folder structure that we've got in here. Um, if you don't, it's not the end of the world. Um, we will, you know, kind of be flagging it though, and we'll need you to move it uh, and fix it. Um, just keep that keep that in mind. Awesome. All right, I have two more questions for you, and then <laughs> I'll hand it back over to you. Okay. Um, next question is for the effects. Should people stick to just Niagara or can they use also other plugins and things like that? And I feel like we could probably broaden that question out as well to just, are people allowed to use any other plugins in general or are we sticking to the core UE tools? So um, you won't be able to add plugins um, globally. So you'd be able to enable it manually for your project, um, but you won't be able to add them um, for to the actual group. So if you build any content with a plugin enabled that's not enabled in the project generally, you'll um, the the content you'll submit just won't work um, on there. It'll either just be invisible um, or it'll cause a load of errors. Uh, so don't enable any plugins that aren't enabled in the project by default. If you need a plugin enabled, then you should flag it on our Discord um, as a feature request, and then we can look at adding it depending on what it is. Generally, your content for VFX should be Niagara only. Um, so um, we'll take a look at Houdini support for anyone that wants to bring in any of that content. A lot of the pre-cached Houdini content is already supported with Niagara anyway, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, but we'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Like I said, we want to support you as much as possible with this stuff. So if you have a really cool idea um, that you want to do and you need a specific plugin enabled in order to do that, reach out to us, let us know, and we'll try and support you with it as best we can. Awesome. All right, and then last question, uh, well, for now, I <laughs> should asterisk for now. Um... <laughs> is is i feel like this is kind of a jump off of the one that i asked you previously as well um so obviously people can share their progress while it's going once it's complete is it fine for them to list it under their portfolio things like that if they take screenshots of the parts that they helped with and also will there be credits for this project as well once it's completed uh so you can post any of your work to your portfolio, either on ArtStation or wherever else you put it, that's absolutely fine. You can post progress shots. If your um, if your work is not entirely yours, or if you've got kind of like a scene that and you did an element of it, um, it's it's good practice to make sure that you highlight the content that you actually developed. Um, the best way to do that is just by stenciling out the content you did and having a, a comparison with with just the assets that you did. Um, that's just general good practice. Um, you know, you should make sure that people know which bits, you know, kind of you contributed towards and make sure that you give credit where credit's due uh, on any content that isn't yours um, when you're posting it to your portfolio. Um, in terms of credits, we will have a credit section, but you do have to opt in. Um, as we get a bit closer towards the end of the project, we'll, um, we'll put up a form for that so that you can do it. Um, uh, due to data protection, um, we don't want to just arbitrarily put your name into the sample and then release it. Um, so you will have to specify that you want to be included in the credits for the final sample, and then you'll um, we'll make sure that you're on there. But yes, you will be getting credit. Okay, fantastic. All right, and then I lied again because I'm just doing that a lot in today's stream, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but for anyone that may be encountering issues with like getting their Discord link, for example, if they did sign up before the 24th or things like that, where best can they reach out for help or assistance with things like that? So if you're having issues with the email, um, firstly, 
check your spam. Uh, I know it's an obvious one, but sometimes it's in there. Uh, <laughs> Turn secondly, it off and on again. <laughs> yeah, secondly, make sure that you're checking the right email um, because it will go to whichever email you've registered your ArtStation account with. So if you've um, added another email to that, um, it won't send it to that. So it needs to be the one you've registered with and you log in, uh, you log in with. Um, we've had a few people already um, go, oh yeah, it's in the wrong email. <laughs> so just check that first. Um, and then if you if if you definitely can't find it and it's not in any of those areas, you definitely put your challenge submission in before the 25th and it's showing you as a challenger on uh, the ArtStation challenge page. Um, then you should you can contact ArtStation support um, uh, to, to get some help with that. Um, so the, the page for that is, if you go to your ArtStation account, you go to the top right, uh, and then you go to help. There's a help section there and you can contact ArtStation support to get, um, to get some help, um, with that. Alrighty. Fantastic. And that's it. That's, that was my last surprise question. You sure? For, for you that, sure? For now. Well, I can always find another if we want, but no. <laughs> So I yeah, should, I've been talking for a long time now. I don't know, Sam. Do you want do you want to take over and do uh, do a bit of perforce uh, overviewing on that stuff? Sure, why not? Let's talk perforce. Yeah. And so I page dot. <laughs> so there, I think first up, yes, there is a thirty-page Project Titan perforce guide yeah. that's in the README channel for the Discord. Um, it is also in the perforce help channel which should be your first port of call if you get stuck and the perforce guide does not help you. What I would say is please read the guide. Most of the answers you need are in there. If you encounter something that is unclear, I've been updating it as we get feedback. So if you encounter something confusing, just let me know and I will update the guide. Um, there are now some really nice people in our community who are already in the perforce channel helping out. We also have some really nice folks from perforce in the perforce channel helping out. So if you get stuck, they should be able to help you. Um, what I would ask is that, as Aaron said, everyone is going to be slamming the service today, even with our various proxies around the world. So just be a little patient when you're syncing. Um, it will sync eventually. I've also added a uh, crash help channel. So I did uh, ask in the doc if you could install the editor symbols for debugging. It's optional, you don't have to, but it really helps us if you do encounter a crash to find what is causing the crash and let us debug it. So um, if you encounter any of that stuff, post in crash help and I will go take a look at it and go, mm. and then see if I can help at that point. Uh, but yeah, Perforce, if you are not used to using Perforce, the way I tend to think of it as is it's, like a library only you're allowed to scribble in the books. So Perforce is a depot, like imagine it's a library full of books. You can check out a book and then you can write in it and check it back in. And then the updated version of the book is now in the library. That's sort of how it works. So what it means is we are recording every change that you make. And if so, if something bad is checked in, we can roll back or we can remove it. If you're like, oh, actually the version I did two versions ago, is the better one than is the thing that you can do in perforce. We generally don't want to encourage rolling back to older versions because that can lead to problems, but it is a resource control program. So you can, if you, but basically you should mostly just be submitting change lists with short descriptive uh, descriptions. Unreal won't actually let you check in a change list without a description. Perforce is a little more lenient, but please write a change list description. It will make everyone's life much easier. If you do just say, you know, desert biome, cactus needles, you know, update or whatever. So we know it's specifically what you're working on. And if you have, as I said, if you have Perforce issues, go to the help channel. But yeah, mostly it should be pretty simple. After a while, you shouldn't be doing more than checking in and checking out. The one thing I would say is if someone else has checked out your work and you are in the middle of working on it, just reach out to them and go, oh, hey, did you mean to check out this thing? Uh, if they didn't, they can just revert it, no harm, no foul, really easily. And if they're working on it, you can, you should work it out as, you know, friendly professional adults and just let them finish what they're doing and then you do what you're doing or vice versa. It should be fine. Um, if you, if people do trolley things, um, they will be removed from the Perforce server. So, you know, don't do trolley things. 
uh, we will see them, we will fix them, and then we will remove you from the server. If you did something by mistake, everybody's done something by mistake, just go, oh no, I just did this awful thing in Perforce, everything's ruined, and we'll go, no, it's fine, and we'll fix it. Uh, because we have, in our years as game developers, made all of those same mistakes, it's totally fine. Ultimately, don't be scared of it. It's just a program to help protect your work, and uh, let us make a game together. So that was my rambling Perforce spiel. Read the doc. Um, there is also a tech art doc. That doc will be updated pretty regularly as we have these discussions, as sort of Aaron goes. Certain directions with things, um, we will make sure that all those docs are up to date. All docs are version numbered, so, and in the README channel, I list the latest version numbers in the channel description, so you should know you'll have the latest version of the doc. And we're going to see if we can set up something better than just pasting PDFs into Discord, but that's where we're at for now. We will try and improve that over time if we can. Fantastic. Uh, and one other thing, and this is not directly Perforce related, but it's just sort of collaboration wise. I want to emphasize that using smaller bits of stuff to build larger things is generally a really good practice. And so if you're, you know, to build Aaron's point, if you're building a bridge and you have planks and ropes and all these bits, it's better to bring in the planks and ropes and so on as individual props and combine them if you can, rather than just going bridge because then we have reusable assets and it keeps the project uh, in a more yeah. under control scale because if you have a plank, you don't have to make a plank. So, you know, collaborate with your fellow artists, see what's out there. There's all going to be all kinds of cool things that you might be inspired by. Amazing. There's, I'm really excited about all of this. And yes, I agree. Please don't be afraid of Perforce. Uh, source control is here to help you, I promise. Don't all right, worry, I've done it. I've done bad perforce things. You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, we've all we've all broken Fortnite at, at like one point or another. <laughs> very <laughs> angry QA person in our Slack. It's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, accidental stuff. You know, it's 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 absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. We'll we'll, you know, this is the benefit of revision control. We have access to all of the history of it. So you know, worst comes to the worst, we just roll it back um, for this stuff. Um, so please don't be afraid, but also please don't be afraid to ask questions as well. Um, this, the whole reason we've set this up is, is to help people learn how this stuff works. Um, you know, when I went to uni, we didn't do any version control, um, you know, kind of at all. A lot of people get exposed to Git some of the time, which is, again, it's, um, it's fine for programming, but not very good for art, um, art content because you can't lock content. You can't, um, you get limited on file sizes and stuff like that. So Perforce is, you know, it's a brilliant example of this stuff. It's it's industry standard. Um, it's used by hundreds and hundreds of AAA studios and small studios around the world. Um, it's a really, really good thing to learn um, how, you know, kind of how it works. So spend some time and read through the documentation um, that we've that we've put together on this stuff. Um, we go over all of the kind of like the keywords um, that you're likely to run into, like Sam said, like depot and check in and check out and um, and add and remove and shelve and stuff like that. So, um, you know, this stuff is really, really useful. It's a big part of game development. Um, that obviously, gamers never see. <laughs> Um, like all the spreadsheets that we use. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's 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 well worth well worth learning and going through. Um, and once you've once you've got accustomed with it, you won't want to work without it. Um, and you can set up your own personal Perforce server really easily as well. So um, I've got one for my personal content, and I so, you know I back up all the time. So uh, it's really good. Um, don't just use memory sticks. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Don't go, oh, it's in a cloud drive. It'll be fine. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Get a, get a proper the version of it. Uh, <laughs> hey, memory sticks have their place in time, okay? Yeah. The, the one, one thing worth mentioning, though, and this harks back to something Aaron already said, which is it is bet we have folders set up for things. It is better to put things where they're meant to go rather than putting them somewhere else and then moving them where they went to go when you're when they're meant to go when you're happy with them. Moving things in Unreal is complicated. Moving things in Unreal with source control is 
extra complicated because there's more files involved. There are multiple people checking out files. So put stuff where it's meant to go and you, you will generally be a happier, more relaxed person. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, if you're fine with it, saying there's a couple questions that did come in super quickly. Um, if you're good with it. Yeah, okay. sure. Um, first one about the documents. They're wondering if these documents that you have set up for Project Titan, if you have to be registered for Titan to be able to see documents like this, or if they will be publicly available. Probably need to be cleaned up a bit for the general public, but yeah, I mean, they're just things we wrote to help people. That's not, I may have to remove, say, the SSL for our server before they're available to the public, but you know, uh, there's nothing, they'll probably end up as an Epic Developer Community article or something about setting up your Perforce. <laughs> yeah, the, at the moment, they're very, very much focused on this is how you set up Titan. Um, yes. So they're only really useful to the people who are actually working in that. Um, but we will be, um, all of the documentation and the stuff that we're working will get publicly exposed at some point um, so that people can see it. The the Perfil setup doc, I mean, we, we do have some Perfil's documentation on setting that stuff up um, already available, um, but we'll be adding the content that we've developed for it to that. Um, and again, like one of the things when we spoke to Perforce about this, one of the big things they want is making it more accessible uh, to people who aren't, you know, kind of code oriented. Um, so they want it to be as friendly for artists as possible to set up. Um, so that's something that we're we're really trying to push on to help make that more more easy for you all. Fantastic. All right, and the last one I'm going to throw at you for now. For now dramatic voice while I find it because I lost it. There it is. <laughs> um, is there a limit to how many things someone can check out at once? Not really. Uh, I, I especially might know if we have a max checkout size, but as far as I know, you can check out as much as you want. We do control what you can and cannot check out. So there's a whole yeah. bunch of the project you can't check out. Um, but there's a lot of it you can. Please don't check out everybody's work. If you do it by accident, you're going to have to revert it and everyone's going to like make cranky faces at you in Discord. Uh, but yeah, you can technically check out whatever and then check in whatever. But what I recommend if you're dealing with a large amount of assets, especially if you're splitting yourself between multiple disciplines, create multiple change lists. A change list is the thing that you check your work in with. It lists all the changes you've made, all the new stuff you've added. You get a default one, anything you add will be added to that, but you can create change lists from that. So if you're doing say, oh, this is more, these are all my props and prop materials, they go in this change list. These are all my environment stuff, these go in this change list. It's easier to keep your stuff organized. At the same time, regular check-ins are good unless something is actively broken. It is better to have it backed up on the Perforce server than just existing locally on your hard drive. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, if you don't back up regularly and something goes wrong, you're like, oh, I've rolled back something from 10 days ago and now I'm sad and you don't want that. Yeah, I mean, whenever you check out content, you're potentially blocking another person from working um, and, and, you know, kind of like creating. So you should be really careful with what you check out and, and make sure that you're only checking out content that you actually need to modify. It's, it's very, very easy to check out content that you that you haven't actually you know really needed to modify if you click on an asset and you move it um it will get dirtied which means that it will want to be saved as soon as you save it's going to ask you to check it out and if you're doing that with a lot of content it's going to be doing it for the entire thing so the world that you're working in um is going to be you know kind of it's going to have the potential for you to be checking out a lot of content and some of that might be unintentional so be really really um you know kind of like conscious of how you're doing it again we've got some guides in the perforce tech guide to to help you um set up the project in a way where it's gonna it's gonna ping you on checkout as soon as you actually modify an asset um that's a really good way of you identifying whether you know the thing that you've just checked is something you actually need to check out or not um, but yeah, just be just be really cognizant of that. Um, we have also implemented automatic revert as well. Um, so so this is in place um, to stop people from from kind of hogging assets or sitting on assets for long periods of time. Um, you do only get Seb, remind me, is it twenty four hours on an asset when you check it out? 
I need uh, to double check the setting right now, but yeah, you're not going to be able to uh, just check out something and uh, lock access on that. And um, we also have the uh, ability to restore access. So it's uh, uh, don't be afraid to reach out over the Perforce uh, help channels. And if you need access for something and we can help coordinate for, for yeah. some of that. Mm -hmm. But that's a you know it's a really important point, right? So we've we've implemented that because it's really easy to check out content and then just leave it and and sit on it, and and at that point you're kind of like waiting for someone to say, hey, you've checked this out, can you check it back in again for me if you're not using it? Um, so actually, when you check out an asset, you are on a timer um, for that content. If you don't check it back in within the time frame, it will revert that content. Now, mm -hmm. when we say it will revert that content, it won't revert the content on your local machine. So the changes that you've made will still be on your machine. But what it means is the asset is no longer checked out, which means that someone else can, can then check it out. So if I have an asset checked out, I make a load of changes to it and I miss the 24 hour window when that asset is checked out, it's gonna get reverted back. And then Sam could then check out that asset, make some changes, and then check it in. Now that will mean that he uh, his submission is ahead in the revision. We have two control, versions of the assets right? now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically, your only real option is to pull that new data and then do a comparison and go, well, do we want to keep that or do we want my change? Um, and at that point, you need to talk to Sam um, contextually. Obviously, don't just talk mm. to Sam. Please don't just just issue. talk to me about version <laughs> conflicts. You know, talk to the person who's. Uh, Gently yell at Sam. And, and come to a resolution on that content. Um, but we've implemented this because we, we, we're we really confident that it's very easy for you to sit on content for a while. So we want something in place that's going to make you go, okay, I need to check the content out, make my changes, and then check it back in. There's nothing that you should be doing that should take longer than 24 hours on a check-in, even if it's iterating on something, right? You should check in the content iteration that you have and you should be making it clear through that content check-in that you are iterating on an asset and someone who's working on it should then talk to you about it before they come in and start making changes on top of that. So, um, you know, kind of if we're talking about a prop, for example, you should build the block out, submit it, check the submit out, work on the low poly, put it back in, check it in. And you should just keep iterating on that back and forth, right? You should have very regular check-ins on the content and none of that content should be more than 24 hours when you're doing it. Um, this is not standard practice in the industry. No. <laughs> so I kind of think maybe it should be, um, but it's not something that we generally do, but it is something that we're, we've implemented for, for this project, just to try and keep the project going and keep it moving as you go forward. Um, again, if we run into loads of issues with this, we can disable it. Um, but we think that it's going to do, you know, kind of more good uh, than harm. So this lets me segue into something, which is why moving things in Unreal is bad. So when you move something, what you're really doing is deleting it and recreating it in its new location. In the old location, there's a thing called a redirector, which is a temporary redirect for the editor and the engine to know where the new the thing is now. You don't want to let those pile up because they start to make your project inefficient. They can lead to bad stuff. So what you do is you go to the folder where the thing was and you click on it and say, fix up redirectors. However, that is going to find everything that references the thing that you moved and check it out so it can update the reference, which means if someone else has it checked out, you can't update the reference. And then suddenly you have a thing that has an outdated reference in the build. So once again, it is better to put things in the right place and moving things is complicated and combine that with the, oh no, I've checked out half the project because I moved this thing. Just put things in the right place. If you do find yourself in that scenario um, and you're not sure what to do, reach out to Perforce Help or one of us and we'll help you work your way through it. But yeah, don't move the things, put them in the right place. Touch yeah, it, it's one of the worst. It's one of the worst bits of advice I think we put in that tech art guide. It's like just put it in the right place to start with. Um, what could go wrong? <laughs> um, and I know that that's really, really terrible advice, um, but it is the best way of doing it. So I, I just ran through it while Sam was talking, then to kind of show you what happens. 
Um, so when you move the asset, um, you can see that that's the original asset that's now been checked out, M underscore uh, smoke cloud. That's now been converted to a redirector and you can show redirectors uh, in the filter settings. If you just type it in, I've got it added to my, um, to my filter tab, but you can show redirectors here. So you can see that that's now visible. By default, they're hidden. Um, so it will look like the asset has been deleted, but it's actually just been converted to a redirector. And then the new asset has been placed here. Um, so what you, like you said, what you need to do is you need to go in, uh, right click on the asset and then fix up redirectors. And then at that point it will check it out. Now, one of the big things you also need to keep in mind that when you do this, it is going to need to manually go into every asset that that thing references awesome. and check it out. So. If you've moved an asset that's referenced by 50 other things, like I've made a texture and it's referenced by 50 materials, it's going to have to check out every single material because basically mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're going manually go in and reconnect this to the new asset that's been done. Um, so whenever you're moving assets around, keep in mind that that's what you're doing, right? You're creating a new asset. Uh, you're not doing it. So, so when you do it, you, make, you have to make sure that you fix up redirectors before you submit, um, and you have to make sure the content you're checking out is it actually available for you to check out uh, as well. Um, so yeah, keep that stuff in mind. <laughs> just just wanted to add uh, two cents to, to this. Um, Aaron, you mentioned before that it's a good idea to keep things modular, right? And uh, this actually helps with redirectors. It helps with uh, a lot of these checkout issues a lot, right? So if um, this is actually one of the reasons uh, why Unreal is architected the way that it's architected and you see things like uh, not just monolithic materials, but uh, you actually have material functions. Uh, you're going to see animation blueprints, but you also have animation layers, things like that. Uh, you, you don't just have uh, monolithic actors, but you also have components. And one of the main advantages of uh, working this way is that um, if you only need to work on part of um an asset okay you only need to check out uh, the part that you're working on and you only need to update that and as long as you don't change the references uh, then you don't need to check out the other assets and it's all going to work organically right so something to consider when you're uh, doing things like um levels and um or different parts of the environment is uh, it's better to um do things like uh, make a level make a um a module that's made of many parts uh, that you can edit independently uh, without having to modify the the full level and it's going to help a lot with, in in these cases yeah and and this is one of the really interesting things you'll see uh, you'll start to experience as well if you've never done large scale development you you probably will be thinking a lot when you use unreal why like why is there so much like like segregation of content why is it always broken down into such little pieces and it's only really once you start working at scale that you start to realize how useful it is that that content is broken down. And it's all because of check-in and check-out, right? All of these files that are, you know, are, are binary files, which means that, you know, like you can't, you can't merge it together like you can with, um, you know, with code. Um, so having those assets split out and separated means that we can all check out stuff. And one of the really big benefits, which is kind of new to uh, Unreal 5, is uh, is world partition and external actors. And that's how we've kind of set out the actual game world as well. So inside our maps folder, if we go to Titan Main, um, this is our main game world map that we're going to be using for the duration of the project. So it's going to take a little while to load, uh, and that may get longer <laughs> and longer uh, as we start adding more and more content to that, uh, to that map. Um, but this is all using external actors. Let's just give it a second to think about building it. Shaders, building shaders. It's going to freeze. Um, so basically, every asset that we place inside this game world is going to be a standalone actor that goes into the uh, if a folder in your browser called, uh, it's called external actors. Uh, so that is going to basically give you full access to that, um, that content. Very exciting. In general, I also have to mention while we're waiting, the vibes in chat are immaculate right now. You all are great. It's great that you all are excited. We're also excited to see how this ends up. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be, this is going to be really cool. That's, uh, yeah, that's good. Cause I think I've just massively crashed my computer. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just gone. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> so if you can post, if you uh, post in the post... Crash Help Discord channel, then yeah, I I'll might be able it. to help you with that. <laughs> Discord. I've got a crash. Oh, it's beautiful. Um, oh no. <laughs> oh, oh. I think we've so, frozen your camera now as well. So I it's mean, spreading. It, it it is worth pointing out that you know obviously titan the main titan thing is a giant open world it will often take a long time to load if you work on a machine with less ram it will take longer to load and be more of a hassle to deal with um when we get aaron back in the land of the uh, unfrozen he'll probably talk about how we plan to put things into the world if you looked into the tech art doc there is a lot about build, creating pack level instance or building PCG graphs, things like that. Um, but yeah, we're trying to find basically what we're asking people to do is in general, not place things directly into the world, but work through an intermediary one so you can work in your own level to tune things without having to work in Titan main, but also so we can more efficiently place things in the world and potentially reuse them across multiple locations if we need to. Oh, Aaron, we knew him well. <laughs> I, I guess top tech Aaron. content team is two people now. It's going to be great. <laughs> oh, no. We went from three to two. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so all right, 33% so reduction. And now uh, I'm a tech designer, so we're all doomed. Uh, this is going to be a less, much less pretty project now. <laughs> we're we're going to have way worse materials without Aaron. But, you know, well, Aaron's off. We can, let's start adding features to character movement. Let's go for it. It's, it's, there we it's go. Time, it's time Seems... to add parkour. Let's not add parkour. Uh... Not yet. We'll, <laughs> no. we'll see that on the line where it goes. Yeah, this, this is where we all. This is where we, Aaron comes back and fires me. Um, keep adding features while he's gone. That's what we but should do. I, yeah, this is the actually, time. Everybody, put in what features should we add while Aaron is crashed them. from the stream. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so actually one thing to talk about that is from a design perspective, since I'm going to talk about design stuff, um, is we actually have a lot of movement settings on the player character mm -hmm. in, um, in Project Titan. So you can run, you can jump, you can, and this is all Sebastian doing uh, magic in code. Uh, you can run, you can jump, you can glide, you can float on water on our walk. You can slide down mountains on the walk too. Um, the walk is summonable. It is a walk. We're specifically referring to it as a walk until it becomes something else. Um, and but like yeah, we have cooking utensil in case anyone is confused. <laughs> yes, well, a walk. You can stir yep. fry in it. They're great. Uh, we... we we can actually show them some yeah, do you some wanna, stuff like. Do you want to do some some driving? This is the Titan sandbox. We have grappling hooks. We have all kinds of fun movement modes. So as you're sure. thinking about layout in the environment, I posted this in the layout Discord. Play with the movement things because the play, way the player moves the world really dictates how you experience the world. So it's designed to move you quickly over big spaces, but also let you slow down and really breathe in the environment. Right. Um, one of the cool things um, early on, Aaron mentioned that we're not actually using the character movement component for uh, Titan. Um, we're using a new plugin uh, that is actually experimental at the moment, but uh, I think that it has a lot of future uh, that is called Mover. And one of the really cool things about Mover over the character movement component system is that it's much more modular. Uh, again, <laughs> modular, modular, good, modular right? design. Oh yeah, absolutely. And because of this, it's much easier to modify, right? So um, as you can see, I'm moving here. And if you just see this, then you're just uh, going to think, well, this is a third person character. It's actually not even a character, it's a pawn. So it's, um, uh, I'm not forced, uh, for coders, for people uh, that are more experienced with gameplay, I'm not even forced to inherit a lot of uh, the um, uh, core characteristics of, of a biped character to do something like this. Um, and I can do stuff like grapple hooks. So um, please excuse the programmer art, but I can actually... Um, we have animators. Do... There will be animation. Oh, yes. Please. please <laughs> there will add be art. Yes. I love it as is. It shouldn't is... be touched. <laughs> so this is what games look like before we ship them, pretty much, for mm -hmm. the longest time. And they're like, art will appear. <laughs> yes, and that's when it really starts uh, shining. 
I'm I'm really looking forward to that because I uh, I wanted to share this for I've been want, meaning to share this for a while uh, over social media, but uh, I wanted to look pretty before I do. I, I um, love your animation, I have to say. But yeah, we've got gliding, see? gliding. We have gliding and grappling. Oh, yes. So we you can really. Let me show you gliding. So if you jump from here and you just hold space, uh, you're going to uh, have a slower gliding animation. And uh, you can actually see a, a, a bar over there. Uh, that is actually a stamina implementation. Um, why are we doing stamina? Because it's one of the things that is um, going to be notoriously difficult to do with character movement component, especially in multiplayer games. Uh, uh, coordinating resources. Um, over a network game is is actually uh, something that Mover is very good at, and uh, it simplifies things a lot. Um, How about the, all that nice looking water you've got right there. Oh yes. Um, so back. if you go into the water, <laughs> you're actually going to um, go into. You're going to be able to walk on water. I'm going to steal that joke. We were talking about <laughs> before. I I beat you to it. Um, <laughs> And this actually works on, on slopes. So once Aaron's back, uh, he can probably show it to you on the environment. We have a lot of very nice slopes on the uh, basic landscape. Um, so moving downhill is going to be uh, pretty awesome. That was the first thing I demanded was, I want to slide down a hill. Just give me sliding. Mm -hmm. And I will Let's do see if anything. I can show it to you over here. So I don't really have a lot of very good slopes here, but you can you can see that this actually works. Um, we were experimenting with some other features. So we actually have um, um, updraft volumes. So um, you can place them in the world. And that way, you're going to be able to uh, get some extra movement out, out of gliding. And yeah, this, uh, there's a lot of possibilities here. And we're only just scratching the surface. Um, there's uh, there's limits to the scope that we can go um, with Mover on Titan, but I'm really excited to keep exploring this in the future. Oh, it's so awesome. So we got Aaron back. Um, he's back. Hello. Are you running? Uh, do you want to show running. people some... I'm not running yet. I'm still going. Yeah. <laughs> No worries. Uh, while you can go wrong. While you prep, I, I can keep showing this uh, a little bit. Give you some more time. So uh, we mentioned that uh, uh, Mover, the character motion component, is modular. So if you, you if you actually go into the pawn, you go over here. Um, and you can't edit notice... this stuff. So feel free to open it up and see how we did it. It's totally fine. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to add different states. And this is one of the major changes uh, compared to character movement component before, because you might you, you can actually add additional states, additional movement modes over here. And uh, these are some of the ones that we've implemented uh, before, um, plus some of the mover examples uh, content that we have here. Um, so this actually means that you can add movement capabilities uh, to your character um, pretty easily. And uh, you can have shareable configurations uh, between different um, be between different uh, movement modes. So you can see that uh, there's actually stamina control over here. There's sprinting velocity. We actually have a um, long uh, sprinting jump um, that is going to influence some of these things. Uh, we can actually do curve-based uh, stamina usage. Um, we actually have a soft landing uh, mechanic in place so you don't actually pancake against the world. Um, this used to be so hard. I'm just going to say, as someone who used character movement component for a long time, this used to be really challenging. So this is uh, super exciting. Um, we're also, there was, I had, an, I had a thought, and then I lost it, because that's what happens when you're on hour two of the live stream. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so... yeah, that was it. So our camera stuff that is related to the character movement modes is all on a data table, too. So you can see all of our camera settings, how we set up the camera, how it transitions from mode to mode. So we can, you know, feedback is always welcome and all this stuff in terms of how mm -hmm. we've implemented it, how we're going to tune it and all of that, you know. Yep. Doesn't mean that we'll do it, but we'll certainly take your feedback. 
absolutely. And um, again, this is code that is going to be freely available. So if there's anything here that's uh, actually useful for your projects, uh, feel free to use it. Happy to. It's been fun uh, coding all of this stuff and uh, happy to give back to the community with this. All right. Um, I'm going to stop um, sharing my screen and boring you with uh, uh, programmer related stuff. <laughs> no, uh, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out uh, over the channels if you have feature requests. Um, won't promise that uh, we're going to have the time on, or, or the scope to actually do all of all of this, but uh, we can at least listen and, and see what, what can be done with the resources that we have available. Awesome. All right. This is good. This is good. This is good. Sorry, catching up on chat here. Also, if anybody does have other questions as well, please make sure you post them in chat so we can collect them. Um, make sure you put question in all caps at the front of it, just because chat can go a little quickly. That helps me make sure I can actually pick them out in time. <laughs> but if you have some, please make sure to put them in there. Happy to grab them for you. All right, so what's next? Have What's I next on the agenda, my, my friend? I've got my computer back. <laughs> this is so, good. Uh, this is so progress. Yeah, we, can do, we could do a little bit of the world overview. I may have missed some of it um, while my computer completely froze. We uh, we did uh, movement stuff. Oh, perfect. So you could do okay. world overview. Yeah, sure. Um, great. Okay, so, so this is our main game world, um, loading flawlessly. Uh, as you can as you can now tell um so this has been built in a in in a very specific way to to how unreal works we're using all of the kind of the new the new tech um that came out with unreal 5 and that stuff has been kind of like refined over time so to give you a bit of an overview um we have our big eight kilometer game world and this is a single level um so you can find it inside uh, inside our maps folder and then inside Titan main. That's where our main game world is and that's where all of the actors are placed. Uh, when you place an actor into the world, so if we do uh, a quick cube or something like this, and please don't do this, um, but if you place an actor within the world, you can see that we get a little question mark appear next to it inside our outliner. Uh, and that's because we've got the revision control um, section enabled. If you don't see that, um, you should be able to add it as a filter uh, under revision control, and you'll be able to see that content um, appear. It's well worth doing if your project isn't, uh, if your uh, screen isn't set up for that. And what we can do is under this, we can actually, you know, kind of like refresh these assets. We can go in, uh, and if I uh, probably need to save it, and if we save it, we can then check that asset in. Um, so one of the really cool things about Unreal is that even though we're working in a single level, these are now actually all separated files. Uh, and we can see those files if we go into our, uh, we go to our Explorer view for a second, and we go into content, we get a folder called external actors. Inside external actors, we have all of our maps that use the external actors folder, and all of those get actually added. So um, you won't be able to tell very easily what files uh, relate to what on here um, because they're all kind of encoded with a generic, um, you know, kind of like key and folder structure. Um, but basically, uh, that means that every single actor is individual. So the really cool thing about this is that um, we actually check out per asset, not uh, for the whole level. And that means that we can all kind of work on it collaboratively without checking out and blocking uh, the way each other work. Now, the way that we want you to build inside this level is not by placing individual uh, meshes and assets into the scene. The one caveat to that is if you're a level designer and you're blocking out a large area, um, that's fine. Um, you can go in and you can place and, and block it out if that mesh is intended to be deleted and replaced by vinyl assets later on. Um, so if you wanted to go in and kind of like build a castle in here, then you can go in. That's absolutely fine for you to go into like modeling mode, which we have, uh, and start kind of like adding um, assets into the game world. So if we kind of like scale this box up a little bit, um, we could go in here 
and start kind of like scaling out some of this stuff uh, and building out kind of like a final um, a final asset that we've got inside this world, right? So that's absolutely fine. So you can go in and start kind of like blocking out that content there um, and start building that stuff up. I've actually already seen in the Discord, some people are already doing that and they've already done some really cool looking stuff. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what people actually start adding in. Um, when you create these, one thing to keep in mind is that when you add assets uh, with the modeling mode, it will add it to a new asset location uh, and it will auto generate that. Um, you don't want that uh, because it's gonna make a big underscore generated folder with your name and hierarchy in there. So actually what you're much better off doing is going into the environment, going into the Arctic or whichever region you're working in uh, and then telling it to use. Um, so with this one, uh, we don't have our folder structure yet. So go in, make your meshes folder, not that way around and then go in and set it to use the current folder uh, for that. And that way, when you build assets, they'll automatically get placed in the correct folder. The next thing you'll need to do is make sure you name uh, those assets as well as they go in. Now, if you're building a block out, you can build it kind of like this scale where you're just blocking out the base shape and the intention is for those assets to go away. What you can also do is you could work at the prop level as well. So if you know that you're going to want an asset that's, let's say, uh, a meter by a meter, and you want to place that asset in, um, you can go in, you can place that asset within the world, and then we can call that sm underscore uh, table, for example, um, that goes in, and you can place that in. As soon as you've got those assets in, you should check them in um, as you go through, and that way everyone can see those assets. We are sure that we're going to end up with some overlap on this stuff. Um, so if you see overlap on names, on assets, things like that, just Bring it up with the other artist and say, hey, you know, kind of like, how desperate are you to build this table for the Arctic world? Do you mind me taking a stab at it first? Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but do try to collaborate on this stuff as much as possible um, as you go through. Uh, when you're going very fast here, I'm going to try and slow down a little bit. Um, <laughs> when you're placing actual, uh, um, you know, kind of like collections or scenes, the best way to do that is actually using uh, level instances because they're reusable. Um, they, they give you much more flexibility on how you build uh, and they allow you to kind of like do some other really cool stuff with procedural content spawning. Um, so uh, if you are building um, for that, uh, for any kind of like scene or environment, let's say you're building maybe like a small village or a town, um, and you're going through, you're actually much better off doing that inside a blank level uh, and creating the asset in there and then adding that level as a collection of assets to the scene um, as you go. So uh, let's say we want to put this table inside our level. I realized I'm going to have to open that thing now on stream again, which is going to be, you know, fine, I'm sure. Uh, so we can save out our set of tables and stuff like this. Again, when you're building it out as a level, it should be a reasonably sized collection. And again, you should be collaborating on this stuff. So um, make sure you're using a world that has external actors enabled so that you can share and collaborate. Um, so don't just do it for five tables like I've just done. Do it for, you know, kind of like a good collection of content and then uh, save those assets out. Um, so if you go in, uh, again, we'll do like, uh, let's say Arctic and we'll say uh, levels, uh, go in here, uh, or actually we'll call this level instances. And we'll go in and let's say, uh, we'll call this a table set um, and we'll call this underscore li, there we go. So if we save that asset out, we now have our actor uh, and we can go back to our main game world. Drum roll. I would do it literally, but I'm afraid. <laughs> Jazz hands, yeah. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. Everything's okay. <laughs> Got to jump straight back on that horse. You get a crash, you can't let it affect you. Got to go straight on. And then inside <laughs> our Arctic game world, um, we can go in. Uh, find our level instance asset. We might need to wait just a sec for the uh, landscape to load. Uh, and we can go in and then we can just drop that level instance in as an asset. Um, now, the really cool thing about this is that um, we can do this for multiple scenarios. So um, while we've just placed this in as a level instance, we can also go in and place this in as a packed level. 
um, which is really useful again. So we can kind of create it from a new blueprint. Um, but because we have PCG, we can also convert this to point data uh, and then process it with PCG. Now we're going to be building some PCGs for you. Um, if you're a bit techie, you're welcome to build some yourself as well. Um, but you can basically use this to convert the level to point data, and then you can process it, which means that you can do stuff like aligning things to the landscape. Um, can, you can kind of like group content together. You can filter content out to randomize uh, and, and put stuff out, uh, like that in. Now, like I said, we're in an active developer environment, so we haven't got this stuff ready right now, um, but we will have it, you know, kind of over the next week or so, so that you can start adding that content in. Um, but my my main advice is if you're building props, just stick to adding props and building out that library to start with. Don't worry about placing it in the world. Give the level designers a little bit of a lead time to start actually fleshing out some of that. And if you want to do that, that's absolutely fine. Like I said, we've not gated uh, the, the groups by that. If you want to go and do a bit of level design as well, because you're feeling like you're missing out on uh, putting your stamp in the world, go and do a bit of level design and put some of that content in there. And that's absolutely fine. Um, but otherwise, you generally shouldn't be adding individual assets to the game world. Um, we will be going through and trying to delete that content uh, as you put it through. So try not to do that. Uh, same with using the foliage mode. Um, we generally don't use that anymore. Um, so try to avoid using it. We'll be using PCG uh, for any kind of like placement of, um, of kind of like scattered foliage and elements like that. Keep that content inside standalone levels. Um, and that way we, we break the content out into more manageable chunks. One of the big downsides of having um, world partition and external actors, if you don't do this, is that you start getting a massive, massive number of assets uh, being listed as external assets. Uh, if you imagine this entire game world and we populate this manually just by placing down individual actors, we will end up with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of individual actors in the scene. Whereas if we place it inside a level, a level instance and that level instance contains a thousand assets, and it's only marked as a single uh, asset for that particular world. So it's going to really help with reducing down uh, external actor content, and it's going to make it much more manageable for both us and um, and you guys when you're when you're contributing assets to the game world. Uh, do we have any questions before I move on? We do. <laughs> we, do. we have a few. <laughs> what a surprise! <laughs> what do you, I can't imagine why. Yeah. There's just a whole world to build with 3,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the main one that I've seen pop up a couple of times. So um, I'm going to try and paraphrase these together. So I'm sorry if I miss small parts of your individual questions, but I'll do my best here. Um, will there be any ability to terraform the world, like sculpt out tunnels or things like that? Or is the world as we see it, this is how it is and it's just built onto so we are keeping the landscape fixed um for now it seemed like a really good idea um because it just gives everyone like a fixed playing field uh to work from that being said we do understand that people might want to put holes in to build cave systems um or things like that we're open to it um but that content is locked um so this is one of the other things we'll We'll go into a little bit uh, in a bit, but we have locked out some of the content just to try and keep uh, the the world consistent enough for everyone. If we allow 3000 people to start sculpting the world up in different areas, <laughs> we're going to struggle to keep some consistency there. So so for now, the level is fixed. You won't be able to um, you will be able to edit it on your local machine, but you won't be able to submit those changes. So only um, only we'd, we'd be able to make landscape changes. And we will make some, um, and we're happy to help and facilitate um, the areas that you're building and to make any changes as we need them. We've actually built out an entire landscape design tool, uh, which we've included in as a plugin, um, which allows you to design uh, worlds up to eight kilometers um, in a kind of landmass-esque uh, tool um, that we built, and we actually used it to build and design uh, this whole game world. Um, 
I can try and load that one as well and see what happens. Bring on Let's landscape design. <laughs> what could go wrong? Uh, so yeah. <laughs> it was bad enough with just Aaron and I building the landscape where I'm like, oh, I'm just going to move the. Oh, wait, he has that whole bit checked out. And like, Did you just <laughs> stop the desert? I stopped the Arctic. And yeah, so imagining 3000 <laughs> people, it will just end in tears and bloodshed. Mm. This is true. <laughs> And not necessarily in that order. <laughs> yeah, you can, you, there's no guarantee there. So it'll take a little while it. to run through um, because it's all built using Blueprint. So so basically all of the icons that you see in the world represent a stamp um, or a change to the landscape. Uh, and these are uh, individually movable and non-destructive layers. We actually got up to about 700 layers, I think, at one point, didn't we, um, when we were building? And it, and it, and it ran well um, as we went through. Um, it's a little bit buggy in places, again, because it's, uh, you know, we're, we're just developing it for what we need. This hasn't been built as like a, a new um, way of building for Unreal. This is purely for, for this project. Um, but you'll be able to see it running um, in action here once it finishes running these construction scripts. Um, so basically the entire game world was designed with this. We used external actors again, which was really useful because it did actually allow both Sam and I to work on the landscape design at the same time. Um, we, you know, might have overlapped in some areas once or twice, but um, for kind of like working regionally, uh, it actually worked really well. Yeah, it did. In that. Uh, so you can kind of see it um, stamping through all of the different, um, all of the different layers as we go. Uh, so I'm just going to hide like this. Um, again, um, one of the things to keep in mind, um, both this map and the main map are very memory intensive, right? Um, when you first open it, it will actually just be displaying the H logs, which is why uh, as you're moving around, you'll probably notice that the area around you is blank. And that's because it's not loaded. You still need to manually load in the cell that you want to view. You can, you can help reduce this by manually specifying only small cells to work in, and that's only going to load in the content that you actually are working in in that area. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, so this is our design map. This is how we built out the, uh, the map for Titan. Uh, and as you can see, we have all of these different stamps here. If I go over, I can click on them uh, and I can move the whole thing around. Uh, and you can see it kind of adjusts to the different biomes as we go into it. Um, and you can kind of like modify it and change it and tweak it. So we can do lots and lots of changes to the landscape if we need to. Um, we are going to try and not do that if possible, because we don't want to, <laughs> to mess with uh, other people's work. Um, but it does allow you to kind of like really quickly and efficiently kind of like build up this content um, as you go through. Uh, so. it's, it's worth noting that piece of land that Aaron's moving is huge. Oh, yeah, so massive. yes, if it's we- It's really if hard we... to retain a sense of scale. So we put some characters in. <laughs> So just as a reference, that's the size of landmass that we're actually moving and adjusting right now. Uh, so this it's really hard to keep that in mind when you're building at eight kilometers by eight kilometers. But you can <laughs> see, like that's the just a small mountain. So if you it's ask us to move small. something, it is likely to affect you know a whole bunch of other people who are working in the same area. So things to you know keep in mind. But yeah, yeah, we can do that cross. I think, how many did we get to? We're about 500, I think it is, maybe five, 550 uh, individual layers for all of this, uh, these areas. Um, if you do want to play around with this, you're more than welcome to. That's why we've included it in. Uh, please don't try and move more than one layer at once um, because it will not thank you for it uh, when you do that. Um, but yeah, you can go in, you can move individual layers one at a time uh, and adjust them. Uh, swap out the stamps. We've also got um, material layers as well. So this one's a, a good example. We built the kind of like the little kind of boggy uh, marshland using this um, little material overlay. So you can see you can kind of go in and drop it um, and move it any way you want. Um, and yeah, we're going to do a bit more of a deep dive on this on another live stream. So I don't want to do too much, um, but we did want to show you if you wanted to have a little bit of an explore uh, and, and play around with uh, with some of that content. Awesome. Reopen the main map again. Really need to stop doing that. <laughs> um, another, we've got a couple more questions if you don't mind me tossing them eels away. Mm -hmm. So, um, speaking of just how large the world is, I feel like this ties into that quite nicely. Um, the player can also 
move around pretty quickly, um, even considering the size of the map. So when designing areas, uh, do you recommend people design for the idea of walking speed for, well, actual physically, like with your legs walking speed, not making a pun of using the walk walking speed, you get what I mean? Or should they be designing more with the idea of this super fast movement in mind? Um, I, well, I think it, it kind of depends on the area. I don't I don't see a problem with this having like a small town. And at that point, you're kind of doing just like a this kind of run. This is kind of like max default run speed. And I think that's a good way to kind of like frame a lot of the content. Um, we, you know, kind of where we wanted to focus on navigation of this world and exploration of the world, we've put a lot of time into giving people lots of kind of fun ways to move around, which is why we've put walk riding in um, so that you can pull out a walk and just like slope it down the whole hill. And at that point, you can pick up a lot of speed. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say you should build the world to that set speed. Uh, same with grappling as well. Um, we've put these mechanics in to kind of like just allow you to kind of like move around really quickly. Same with like gliding. Um, but it also covers uh, us a little bit as well if we have some dodgy level design. Um, there's not many scenarios that this character can't get out of. Um, and we want to make sure that we're kind of like encouraging that as we go forward. Um, but yeah, you can kind of go in, you can do loads of stuff. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, and again, if you find any bugs, let us know because we're sure that there are bugs in here um when we uh when we start building this and we'll be we'll be tackling those kind of as we go and fleshing out you know kind of the the game as a whole um but yeah i go for the general run speed is a good is a good standard to work to awesome. um <laughs> next question is in regards to npcs and character art obviously i mean manny is beautiful and perfection incarnate and i don't know how we could improve upon it but they're wondering um are they only making npcs that just live in this world or are they also making other like playable characters things like that yeah that's that's a really good one so um so you're making all of them. The Manny is just the temporary character that's in here at the moment. We have a base character, which is inside Demo Player, called Lost Bang, uh, which is actually being developed by an artist called Folly Gone, who does some really awesome educational material, uh, has a really great YouTube channel as well. So uh, he's building out our base character for us. We're going to be implementing that character in uh, next week. Um, we've already got a bunch of animations um, built in for it as well. So um, you've got kind of like the grapple hook uh, mechanic. We've got when you're kind of like riding and stuff like that. And we'll be adding a control rig so that you can do some animation in engine if you want to um and, and kind of things like that the character itself is going to be broken down into multiple sections as well so you don't actually have to um do a full character replacement if you wanted to you could just do an element um so we've got an example of that inside our tech art doc which i've lost now because i crashed uh, <laughs> oh no i hear it's in the readme discord I hear, I hear it's in the README Discord as well. Um, I hear it's also <laughs> in my downloads folder. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll just open that up again. Uh, da -da -da. No, that's our live stream section. <laughs> live stream section. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Uh, so yeah, inside our art guide, we've put in a general breakdown of how the character is going to work. We should have a nice picture here. So this is one of the more fleshed out versions of the character that you can choose. So we're going to have a base version um, and then the character itself will be split into multiple sections. This is really similar to how Fortnite does their characters. So you can uh, you can break the character down in that way. Uh, and it's the way that characters are generally broken down in multiple games where you want to have different skins and characters. Uh, so we have, um, they're kind of like broken down this way. We have the lower, lower body, upper body, head, uh, and hair, which also combines into a hat. Um, you can basically import your character as these subsections. Um, so if you want to do character design, but maybe you don't want to do a full character straight away, you can use this one. This one comes with a preset skeleton and it comes with um, all of the animations that you'll need to do a full replacement of the main player character. So if you want to add um, your, if you want to replace the main character with your own creation or your own variant, 
then you need to use this skeleton and this setup because that's how all of the hooks are going to be for the uh, actual player character and it's how you'll be able to kind of like interact and all of the animations will work so if you want to use if you want to do a full replacement of the player character you need to use this skeleton and you need to use this setup you can also use this skeleton and setup for npc characters in the game world uh, and you can do retargeting if you want to if you want to modify uh, the shape a little bit more but you don't want to change the skeleton you can do that as well and we'll be supporting you to help you do that if you want to go fully off the rails um, and make your own character with its own skeleton and its own animations you can absolutely do that um, the amount of help we will give you on that will be limited though because we've provided <laughs> this one <laughs> uh, so is that pointing the right way yeah it's okay good um <laughs> So, so yeah, the, the idea is, is that, you know, kind of try and use the, the base skeleton that we've provided because it's going to save you so much in the long run. All you have to do is skin it to the, to the rig that we've um, got and provided and, and you'll be good to go. The animations will work, the gameplay will work and you can, you can do all of that stuff. Uh, we've seen a lot of people already posting in the discord that they love to do some creatures and things like that. That is really really awesome um but it is also going to be a lot more work for you okay so if you do that you'll have to bring in your own skeleton that skeleton should be a shared skeleton so you're going to need to talk to the other character artists in the project who want to do creatures as well so if you want to do a quadruped um that quadruped skeleton should be scared uh, should be shared across all of the should quadrupeds scared. <laughs> yeah scared it was right it was a slip of the slip of the tongue but it was you know it was poignant um so you can do it but it's a lot more work um so if i were you if you're in the character section that's your focus if you want an easier job i would focus on doing a character element first just to get yourself into the groove of it. And then if you want to kind of really push yourself and do something more than that, you can, but you will need to either do the skeleton rig animation setup yourself or find someone else in the Discord who is willing to help you do those things. Uh, and then you can implement those in and we'll, we'll do some cool imp implementation, um, but only if you finish it. Um, so yeah, otherwise we recommend, you know, kind of like we've got this skeleton that's set up. You can rig to just a set part of it. Again, we'll do some more documentation and help on how to do it. You can start just by modeling and sculpting the area that you want to do. So if you want to do a character, sculpt it up, start with it. We'll have some more documentation to help you set those things up. The general principle, though, is that it has to follow the bone hierarchy that we've brought in, though you can add leaf bones on top of that. Um, we, we did a demonstration on how to do that with crop out. So you can use that as a reference, um, for how to add like different hats, which have different animating bits on it, all sharing the same skeleton. Um, but ideally you want to use the lost bang skeleton that we've provided. Um, so please try to do that. Um, you'll get much more support. It'll be much easier for you, but yes, you can. I'm really taking a long time answering these questions. <laughs> I'm good. sorry. Good. <laughs> I should just say yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> that's it <laughs> well but it was more than just a yes right it's a yes and yes, <laughs> also <Or> yes, but. <laughs> a yes but yes as well <laughs> so all good things to know and consider um especially being able to make their own creatures that's a really cool thing for people to consider just with the understanding that there's a little bit of extra extra side work to put in there if you're making well, npcs <laughs> If you are making NPCs, let us know because there's a certain amount of open world and AI behavior stuff we'll have to factor in. So, oh, I am I am fully expecting to have a um, um, mover AI request by the time that this live stream ends. And it might not even be <laughs> not from <sure>. me. <laughs> yeah, I'm. But yeah, like as, just as let, let us know so we can we can think about it. And the make small sure characters that we... as well, they don't necessarily also need to be rigged. Um, so if they're very, you know, small, um, maybe not necessarily down to insect level, but maybe like large, really large insects or um, small, small birds or small creatures, um, you can animate those with vertex animation. Uh, and again, at that point, it's worth definitely posting in the VFX channel because um, you might be able to make a really cool um, someone's already posted that they want to do flying fish, like ghost fish. Um, and actually for that kind of thing, you wouldn't want to rig that. And um, that's much better to have in as a, as a VFX. So at that point, 
posting the VFX channel that you're making this cool thing. Would anyone like to help you uh, help you with the Niagara setup for it? And you can collaborate on those things. Again, collaboration um, is really key on this stuff. Um, you know, find people to help you fill in the areas where you're not as proficient um, or can help train you or, or can help fix it and try and get that stuff done. Um, it's the best way to work. Awesome. Um, with all of that in consideration, like NPCs, props, all of that considered, for anyone who might have missed when you opened some of the uh, reference sheets and stuff that you opened earlier, is there an art bible or some kind of design document for people to reference, especially when it comes to making sure that the different stylized concepts fit together? Yeah, so I mean, like I said, we've produced a uh, an example character um, that should be used as a general art guide, and we'll have that implemented soon. So you'll be able to see that implemented in uh, in Engine. We've also created a base material profile as well, which actually does some light bending. So um, if you see, we've got our character set up here. We've got the base material, and then inside that, we've got a section which does some uh, light shadow sharpening. Um, so we're going to not be doing full true cell shading on the character but we are going to be doing some very subtle um, shadow adjustments. So you can kind of see as we increase that value here, you start to get kind of like a, uh, a cell stripping of the actual actor itself. You can make that really prominent as well if you get rid of all of the roughness uh, calculation and values from that. Um, we don't want to go that far in it though. So we're going to stick with about like 0.8, I think on, the, on that value. That's a good reference point for your characters. Um, We've also, uh, like I said, got uh, the tutorials that we've posted that give you a demonstration of the kind of art style that we're going for. So very painterly, uh, fol uh, foliage should be very volumetric uh, focused rather than like actual models from trunk to branch to, to leaf. Um, so it should be kind of like more of a volume representation, um, you know, going quite Ghibli-esque on, on a lot of this stuff, um, the background environment. So. Um, that should be kind of like a good a good marker and a good guide. Um, like I said, we don't want to be too restrictive with this stuff. So we're trying to put some of this stuff in place to give people a good direction to go for. Um, but if we start seeing some cool deviation uh, on that stuff, um, you know, we'll roll with it uh, on that side. So, um, you know, be creative and try and work within those restrictions to really innovate and we'll see some cool stuff. All right. Very cool. Well, I'm sure that there's still lots of other questions, but I feel like this was a good overview to start with. And obviously for anyone who didn't get their questions answered, there is the Discord for the project that is available to reach out on, as well as there will be a series of live streams um, for anyone who missed that announcement earlier. There will be a series of live streams specifically around Project Titan that will be happening on Fridays at 10 a.m. almost at p.m. 10 a.m. Eastern, um, where Aaron is going to be going through along with other guests uh, of the project, talking about different aspects of it, um, probably answering a couple more questions as things come up along through the process and all those good things. So stay tuned, uh, stay involved, lots of ways to reach out and to be part of the project. Um, I think before we wrap up, I wanted to go around and see if y'all had anything else that you wanted to make sure got mentioned or talked about, if we missed anything that you think should come up. Sure, there's loads. Um, <laughs> there the always main, is. I think the main thing is just, you know, kind of be active in the community um, and, and post questions and we'll try and answer them as much as possible. With that being said, please read the docs first um <laughs> before before posting your question just to make sure that it's not already answered in there um like sam said we're going to be updating that perforce doc and that art guide doc with the most current information uh on how to set that up so just make sure that you're checking through that before you post any questions and then post away um like i said we're also you know we are looking for people to help moderate and to help um you know kind of be pillars of the community on this stuff as we go through. Um, so if you'd like to do that, let us know. Um, but the main way you can do that is just by being active. Um, if you're active on the community and you're helpful and stuff like that, we will find you uh, and we will promote you to a moderator. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind. Um, and also, uh, we didn't even talk about swag um, at all. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So um, we will be giving out Titan swag uh, for the for the project. Um, it's going to be quite staggered, so we're not going to start. We will be giving it out um, very, you know, kind of soon, but we won't be sending it out very soon. It's going to be about a month and a half lead time uh, on swag. We want to build up a good number of people um, that we're sending swag out to. Um, you can get swag for lots and lots of different things. Um, if you are a pillar of the community, um, if you are a good moderator, if you build cool stuff in any of the categories that we have, if you are helpful, if you are, you know, any of those things, um, then you'll be in line for some cool swag that we will be sending your way. Um, if we do that, we'll probably be doing most of the announcements on the live stream channel as we go, but we may be dropping some swag uh, for um, cool people in the Discord as well. Uh, it will be a single swag package that we'll be sending out. It includes uh, some cool stickers, hoodie, uh, pins. Um, we've got a plushie lined up as well that's pretty mm -hmm. awesome uh, that a lot of people internally are already begging me for. Um, uh, so we'll be seeing how that goes. Uh, and a bunch of other cool stuff as well. So, um, you know, if be active, you know, kind of contribute cool stuff and we'll be sending some swag your way. Just keep in mind that um, we won't be sending it out straight away, but we will be telling people who are earning it um, as they earn it um, for that thing. Awesome. Anything Fantastic. else uh, from Sep, Sam? Have you guys got anything? Any last pearls of wisdom? Be nice. Oh, good. Everybody be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a good one. Um, and have fun. Yeah. This is going to be a fun project. Yes, and chaos. absolutely. <laughs> and chaos. Fun <laughs> chaos. <laughs> it can be both. <laughs> this... Yes, absolutely. Um, cool. I do also want to take a second to reiterate that, of course, the main thing about this project is that it is all of you working together to make it work and to make something really fun and exciting. So like Sam said, be nice to each other. Um, everyone get along. This is a collaborative project. And of course, you know, the, the best things that are going to come out of this is if you take the time to get to know each other, form teams, form groups, work together to make these larger areas where you can build a story together and things like that. So take the time to be nice, communicate, let's build something cool together. Um, one last time. Project Titan streams are going to be picking up on Fridays starting next Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. So make sure you hang out for those. Check those out. We will also have another Inside Real stream next Thursday as well. So they're both happening. We're not swapping from just Inside and Real over to Project Titan. There will be both. So your regular Inside and Reels will happen on Thursdays. Plus now you get just a fun extra stream on Fridays. It's going to be a good time. Go check it out. Um, of course, if you're interested in joining Project Titan, we have the link in the description of the video here. So make sure you go check it out if you're interested in registering. Just make sure, like Aaron said earlier, if you do give a little bit of time for us to get through the submissions so that everybody can get involved in the project and get their stuff. It might just take a little bit if you signed up now or after the 25th for it to get back to you, but it will. Just have some patience. It'll get there. And then um, I feel like there's more. I feel like there's more and I'm forgetting. <laughs> oh no, the pressure it got to me. Uh, that's all I can think of. So yeah, go check it out. Go hang out there. If you want to keep up with the latest news for Unreal Engine overall, you can do so at Unreal Engine on all of our social platforms. Uh, GDC happened. That was last week. There was lots of cool things that did happen at GDC. And if you couldn't make it, I get it. <laughs> it's not an easy place to get to for everyone so we actually recorded both our state of unreal as well as our tech talks that we did day of those were live streamed and are available on our channel so if you're interested in checking those out you can do so and our other talks are also being recorded and will be posted over the following weeks so if you're dying for even more gdc content it will be available to you given time so keep an eye out for that as well and other than that one last call out to our wonderful guests for today any last things, last words? That sounded like a threat. It wasn't meant that way. <laughs> no, I think just, you know, join the Discord. Um, 
you know, be good on there. Um, you know, all the people that you're working with are, there's lots of people who are in the industry in here. So if you're interested in getting into the games industry, try not to make any enemies <laughs> early on, uh, with this stuff, you know, um, yeah. And, and yeah, let's have a, let's have a good time. It's going to be absolute madness and we will do our best to, uh, to keep it, um, keep it level <laughs> as we go. <laughs> it's going to be good. What is it? It's like a very thin line between creative genius and madness, and we're treading that line we're definitely very exploring closely. Exploring that line, yeah. <laughs> the line may be a dot, and, and we're just all in insanity. But you know, it's, we're gonna have a good time either way. It's gonna be fun. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing us in the live stream in ten weeks' time. How we look? <laughs> be in. What happens? We'll have Four to have days. a before and after um, comparison. <laughs> Before Project Titan, after Project Titan. It'll be fine. It'll be good. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for hanging out. We'll see you all next week. And with that, have a good day. Have a good week. We'll see you all around, and we'll see you in the project. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody.